<laughs> good morning, everyone. Oh, that's a good crowd. When you sit down the front here, you don't be, you can't see what's behind you. That's a, um, welcome to uh, the climate change session at the UC Davis Noise and Emissions Symposium. And I want to also say thank you for a great day yesterday. It was uh, it's this conference always brings me new perspectives, and for me, that's where the value is: learning from each other and understanding uh, where the challenges are and where the solutions are. Um, so the theme of this conference is adapting for tomorrow today. And I think um, I think we've actually got a, a, a session now that, that kind of fits the brief, uh, which which is good. We're going to be talking about things here that are coming that are here now and are coming over the horizon. So how do we fix uh, fix those problems uh, today so that we're, we're fit for tomorrow? I would also like to say a big thank you to uh, Rachel Burbage from Eurocontrol and Eric Liu uh, from Ramble, who have uh, been uh, working with with me to um, to set up this uh, this panel. And uh, the panel is going to be uh, Philippe Masson from Airbus, uh, who is an air traffic management expert, and he'll be talking about integrating climate change solutions. Uh, we then have Matt Prescott online from Heathrow. Uh, he'll be talking about integrating hydrogen into the uh, aviation uh, ecosystem. And then we'll have uh, Erin Cook from SFO, who will be talking about integrating SAF uh, and the airport role in that. Uh, and then followed by Jerry Griffin from Delta, who will be talking about contrails uh, and rounding off with, with uh, Andrea Dietz from uh, FAA, who will be talking to us about climate adaptation. Uh, I'm just going to. We actually thought rather than have all of our session chairs introduce you know, the, the, the basics on climate change, we thought we'd do it once so our, our speakers can concentrate on, uh, on the, the job in hand. Um, so clearly the consumption of fuel uh, by aircraft emits greenhouse gases, CO2 and non-CO2, and uh, the contribution of aviation to, uh, to global human uh, emissions of CO2 is around about 2.4% or was cited in, uh, in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That's a tongue twister you don't want to start the day with. Uh, their assessment report six uh, in 2018. So we are responsible for 2.4% of, uh, of, of all emissions in aviation. Uh, but worth noting that as other sectors of the global economy decarbonize, and they are decarbonizing, that, that number is likely to get, get more. And of course, with global air traffic uh, demand forecast to grow, more flights will mean uh, more emissions in a do-nothing scenario. Uh, and let's be clear, we're not in a do-nothing scenario. Um, the, pa the panel today will tell you about the things that we are doing. And the industry has a very good track record uh, in reducing its CO2 emissions and implementing uh, challenging net zero carbon pathways. Um, so here we will be not exploring the things that we've already done, but actually looking at novel approaches to reduce aviation's impact on climate change. And then more important, or as, as importantly, turning our, 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 our focus to actually not what our impact on climate change is, but actually what, uh, what climate change impacts are going to uh, occur in the aviation sector. So with uh, no further ado, I will, um, introduce uh, Philippe uh, Masson. Philippe uh, is from the air traffic management and rulemaking uh, section of Airbus. His work there is all about the integration of uh, new flying platforms into the airspace. Uh, with a background in air traffic management, he's built and managed numerous different European air traffic management innovation programs in CESAR, the single European sky uh, R&D program. Philippe's going to tell us today about Fellow Fly, a project to optimize environmental benefits and smoothly integrate these uh, benefits into, date, into today's operations. Uh, can you join me in welcoming Philippe to the stage? Well, thank you for inviting me. It's my first time here. So thank you, Jan. Thank you, Rachel. Um, it's a great opportunity for me to introduce this concept. So uh, based on all the discussions we had yesterday about the impacts on Know that we have to do uh, things. So here I'm here with uh, one part of the solution. So uh, 
we'll discuss that. So maybe but I can just uh, try to wake you up with a question. Uh, have you ever seen the migration birds uh, over in the sky just uh, flying? Uh, do you know why they are flying in V-shape? With their crafts, with, um, with 100 ton birds, uh, simply that. But um, I think you, you are not scared when you see those kind of flights in the sky. So that's what I want to do here now. So let's let's go. Maybe uh, next slide, please. Oh, I have it. Okay. So the principle. Uh, so um, yes, you probably know uh, because you are in, the, in 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 aviation that uh, each aircraft is generating two uh, spirals of uh, air uh, named vortex vortices. Uh, so here you can see uh, with. In that And uh, so um, we usually try to avoid that, of course. Uh, for example, you, you, many people are here from airports, so uh, you are um, doing some separation of the aircraft to avoid having the, the aircraft falling into the vortices. Uh, here, it's exactly the opposite. We are trying to uh, see how uh, we can benefit from that energy uh, to save uh, fuel and emissions. So in fact, those two vortices are rotating movements. Uh, and when you're bringing like in the, on the picture, very close to that region where there is this vortex, you can uh, feel uh, an updraft and then uh, reduce the thrust of the aircraft and therefore save fuel and... Uh, and uh, so in fact, we, uh, we started to experience uh, two big birds um, and uh, flown manually, completely manually with uh, uh, flight test pilots. And so we that we had very incredible rates of savings uh, depending on the position the, the follower aircraft was, because of course, most of the time you can't see those, uh, those vortices. So after a lot of campaigns uh, of flight tests, now uh, we, uh, we know that we can target 5% uh, of fuel, uh, of full trip fuel savings. So, um, uh, and it's more dedicated to long haul flights because we have to spend some aircraft together and compensate that on a second time by uh, the long flight uh, in, in the formation. Okay, so just to continue. Uh, navigation of the vortex. Uh, and a, a lot of uh, uh, other parameters. So here um, we have combination of, uh, of leader and Aircraft are not compatible. Eyes for the same. Uh, we have some compatibility uh, between the aircraft, which is not only linked to the type of aircraft, but as well uh, with. Him. Okay. Uh, second, the position on, on the vortex, of course, the, the more, the, the closer we are to the vortex, the better the benefits are, but uh, we the more take to fall into the vortex. So that's a trade uh, we have to, uh, to deal with. Uh, formation losses, of course, I just introduced that already. Um, you need to uh, burn some fuel to bring the aircraft together. Uh, so we have to take that into account, of course. And time information, of course, the more, the more we save. So what we have developed uh, to uh, is, of course, um, an automatic system on the follower aircraft because we cannot ask a pilot to fly manually uh, something he don't see. Uh, hours, so we developed uh, an experimental automatic positioning that can anticipate where the the vortex. Uh, close to that vortex to benefit, uh, save the 5%, but still uh, being in 
So that is uh, based on a, on a separation of 1.5 nautical miles. It's the, it's the distance where the vortex is quite stable and where we can uh, acquire some data from the leader aircraft sufficiently in advance to be able to And uh, of course, we have uh, had to develop some dedicated our first uh, flight trial. So I have a first video just for you to uh, have some nice pictures to uh, figure out how uh, how you uh, is proximity of the other aircraft uh, in in the cockpit. So maybe we can launch the the first. Just, just one minute, so it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think we can go to, oh no, it's me. Yeah, so to do that, so now, um, well, as uh, here demonstrated, we, uh, we have the technology at Airbus. So it's, uh, of course, it's developed on flight test aircraft, it's experimental technology, but uh, we know that we can make it. So now the question is how to integrate that into the airspace and in fact, it's not a, such a, uh, an easy question because it's uh, first a question of collaboration. Uh, two aircraft means, can mean two different airlines collaborating together. So uh, it's not so often. Uh, instead, uh, inside some aliens, otherwise uh, not so much. And here uh, we would like to have every airline collaborating uh, to be able to perform a flight together. Uh, it's also a question of collaboration with uh, ATC, with regulators, with ATFM, of course, and all those uh, stakeholders. So uh, to be able to, um, to, to do that, we have uh, started to do a lot of different partnerships, including ATS and Eurocontrol that are here today, um, to really uh, think about how to integrate that into the airspace. So uh, we have uh, we we came uh, through a first concept of operation uh, all together. Uh, our first target is uh, to develop that on the North Atlantic, where we had those first trials. But we know uh, and we have already seen that there are other uh, very interesting traffic flows uh, where uh, we would like as well to start discussing developing the concept of operation. So it's the case, for example, for the Trans-Pacific traffic. Uh, so, um, like as well to develop uh, some uh, partnerships there to be able to uh, build. So I have uh, uh, brochures here, so I can uh, drop them there. If you are interested to see a bit more about the concept, you can have one. Of course, uh, it's uh, it will be there. Okay, so uh, to avoid uh, having a long demonstration, I have a second video explaining this concept of operation. Uh, worked with airlines, NSPs, and all the partners that are.
Well, now that we have this first version of the concept of operation you've seen, uh, we are trying to develop some partnerships with uh, with airlines, uh, with the NSPs to try to develop that and refine this con ops um, to be able really to introduce that. So we have, uh, of course, uh, first this North Atlantic where we have already several projects running at the moment to develop that. Um, we have worked with ICAO uh, at the last Assembly 41 to be able to integrate that into their process to uh, uh, provide the regulation to do that. Uh, so that was accepted. And so at the moment, we are looking for uh, the concrete process to update the, the text as well uh, to be able to introduce that into the airspace. Uh, we are working with uh, EASA in Europe and, uh, of course, looking to uh, start doing studies uh, and, uh, and work as well with the FAA to, uh, to be able to uh, develop that in uh, other airspaces where um, the FAA has uh, the airspace. Uh, I mentioned the Trans-Pacific, for example, so it could be very interesting for us to, uh, to start working as well in, in that region. So that's where we are, uh, pushing that, trying to uh, participate to this uh, more sustainable aviation with such kind of interesting projects. Of course, it's not the only one we're developing at Airbus. You may have heard about a lot of other ones on hydrogen uh, electric for this, uh, but I wanted to bring this one today, uh, which is a bit less. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, thank you very much, Philippe. For this really interesting and inspiring presentation it's a fabulous project and it was really good to learn about it uh, we've had lots of good questions coming in already on slido so just a reminder to keep sending them please for all of our presenters and then we will have a q a at the end of the presentations so our next presenter is matt prescott from heathrow uh, matt are you online there hi there yes i'm here can you hear me okay we can hear you loud and clear good afternoon thank Brilliant. you for joining us today so matt is head of carbon strategy at london heathrow where he's responsible for its net zero plan and works with colleagues from across the airport and wider sector to deliver solutions to aviation carbonization and he's also a fellow of the real geographical society and he's going to talk to us today about the napkin project and with that i'll hand it over to you thank you matt Brilliant. Thank you very much. And and um, and thanks for the introduction also for inviting me to participate in this session, which looks absolutely fantastic. Um, and thank you to Philippe as well for really stimulating opening um, session there. And um, I, I'm, I'm just disappointed to say I won't be able to share any superb videos um, with you as part of this presentation, but uh, maybe next time. Um, so my role at Heathrow is as head of carbon strategy, so I look after Heathrow's net zero um, programme. And I was lucky enough to lead a, a collaborative project, uh, which concluded uh, last year, it took about two years to pull together called Project Napkin, um, working with partners from across the industry in the UK. Um, we had three uh, manufacturers, um, three universities, three airports uh, and also professional services company Deloitte involved and we all shared um, a really strong interest in understanding um, the future of zero carbon emissions flight we use the in the UK we're using the acronym ZEF um, for this um, just to point out that this is zero carbon as opposed to zero emissions flight because um, we focused in very squarely on hydrogen here um, which does um, in, in the case of liquid hydrogen, have a non-CO2 uh, impact that we mustn't forget about. So this was about um, understanding, um, can we um, get the UK domestic aviation sector to net zero um, with a contribution from hydrogen? So um, amongst the partners, we worked with... Um, uh, GK and Aerospace, and you've got here one of their concept aircraft, um, which is um, part of their H2 gear program, which is something really well worth 
looking up um, if you're not familiar with that project already. Um, what we um, what we had at the heart of this project um, was a and sorry about the fidelity of the uh, graphic here. We had a model um, which uh, University College London produced called the airline behavior model. And what this does is it fundamentally predicts the um, the uptake of um, hydrogen for propulsion on any given sector according to a whole set of inputs that we supplied into an overarching model. Um, and the headline from this is what it shows is that if we have a sufficiently low price for hydrogen uh, supply, that for UK domestic air travel, the, um, the fuel has the ability to potentially almost completely outcompete fossil kerosene on a total cost of operation basis. This was a really interesting finding. And what it suggests is that the importance of um, national infrastructure enabling green hydrogen at the scale and at the price that is required by the market could actually have a really transformative effect on the market. And of course, albeit that the UK domestic geography um, was necessary for the study, it's clearly apparent that some of the distances um, that we're looking at here, um, for instance, from London to, uh, to Edinburgh, are much longer than some of the routes into continental Europe from the southeast of England. So um, this same model as an application at that um, international scale, um, but we did want to limit the, the study to the UK um, market. Um, now, what this um, graphic is showing on the right-hand side is um, where fossil kerosene is the grey, um, and the yellow through to dark blue colours there are some of the concept aircraft that were developed for the purposes of the study. What it's showing is, um, at, as you moved from the top left to the bottom right of these charts, the penetration of hydrogen in the, uh, um, for aircraft movements in the market is actually displacing um, a ker kerosene al almost completely, as you can see there. So what this um, what this tells us is that for um, planning purposes, for policy planning purposes, um, a focus on bringing the costs down is critically important. And actually, policy instruments like the air passenger duty that we have in the UK, if um, uh, exempted for zero carbon emissions flights, could have a transformative effect on the degree of take up. So we took a um, what we call a five A's approach to assessing the challenge. And this was done um, on the basis of the conversations that kicked the project off. And fundamentally, it was between manufacturers and airports in the first instance. So essentially, the dialogue went um, from a manufacturer point of view. Um, it was really helpful to understand what the constraints are in the rest of the system, so particularly airports, but also um, airspace, uh, critically um, understanding what those constraints are within which they're designing um, concept aircraft. And then from the point of view of the airport and other actors in the system, it's extremely helpful to understand what technology is coming down the track. So this symbiosis um, of understanding really helpful in order to build a picture of what the future market would look like. As it happens, the concept aircraft that were developed for the project were designed to conform to existing airspace constraints. But within that package of work, we were able to actually analyze some of the noise impacts as well. And the overall picture from that was that there would be pretty limited noise benefit. Um, but as you see in the model, um, greater penetration of hydrogen aircraft, um, given a consistent number of air traffic movements, there's a, a, a modest improvement in the noise signature.
Um, one of the other aspects of the project that we, we, we focused on was understanding what passenger expectations would be. So one of the, one of the surveys that we uh, completed for the project essentially established that for approximately half of respondents, they would be prepared to engage with um, a, a, a more environmentally uh, friendly experience, um, but with accepting only uh, limited um, reductions in the overall ex um, passenger experience. So they would, for instance, accept a longer flight time in exchange for uh, a lower carbon flight. That was an interesting finding. So we worked through three case studies to, um, uh, to, to really bring some focus to the project. Um, the smaller aircraft were um, modelled by Cranford Aerospace Solutions, uh, who are planning to retrofit um, currently a Britain Island Normander, um, Britain Island, Britain Norman Islander for the purposes of um, short uh, island hopping routes, um, potentially in Scotland, uh, other locations as well. Um, these aircraft are expected to come into operation commercially within the space of uh, two to three years. Um, and actually the importance of delivering these retrofits is largely around the learning um, in terms of R&D. Um, huge amount of considerations for airports uh, in particular in preparing um, infrastructure and particularly around compliance, some of the drier issues that need to be understood. So albeit that these aircraft represent um, a small percentage of the overall movements, the learning opportunity is absolutely enormous. And moving up through into, and this is one of GKN's clean sheet um, 40 seaters, um, moving up to the clean sheets, there was clearly a very big lag in terms of timelines. So albeit that the, the um, estimate of timelines wasn't an output from the model, the um, the period with which we would expect, the period with which we would expect to elapse before these aircraft are available in the market is such that um, the learning benefits of those small initial aircraft it really is, is significant. It was also a consideration whether to retrofit or deliver clean sheets for these size of aircraft. And the project team were pretty consistent in concluding that the additional one or two years penalty to move directly to clean sheet, the big advantage because the clean sheet aircraft would be um, much easier to design to deliver um, uh, the performance that we would that would be most um, uh, competitive in the market. And as you can see in the statistics on this page, the potential in a mid scenario was for these aircraft to outcompete um, the incumbent conventional aircraft on about 50% of routes. And then as we move up to the largest aircraft that were used within this study, these were 90 seat aircraft, um, we see that actually um, the volume of hydrogen required to support now uh, potentially quite significant penetration in the market is such that airport infrastructure becomes a significant consideration. Now, the picture here is very much of truck-based delivery being viable in, in the initial phases, precisely because entry into service and the rate of fleet renewal in the early period will be relatively insignificant. But some of the studies um, outputs look at specifically the, the, the break breaking point of truck-based delivery. And at that point, much more intrusive infrastructure is required at mid to larger airports. This is 
expensive but the critical point about it is it takes a long time in the planning system um, and through through master planning through delivery in order to bring about and therefore there's a significant risk that if airports don't start to prepare for the introduction of um, hydrogen flight in, in the pretty much in the near term that actually the delays in the um, in the development of the market would be could potentially be more attributable to airport infrastructure and ground infrastructure than the aircraft themselves. And just as a reference point, the um, the aircraft in the so-called napkin fleet, this gives you a sense of range across the US market, so you can get a feel for um, what the 90-seater would be capable of at the uh, outer periphery there. And then um, just to move forward to um, uh, to some conclusions in a moment, this is just a little bit more on the airport infrastructure. On the left hand side there, this is London City Airport um, uh, relationship between hydrogen and uh, uh, traditional fossil kerosene movements um, out to 2050. There are three scenarios presented there, the light green are the hydrogen movements. So you can see a, a, a pretty high degree of, of, of penetration towards 2050. And at 2050 itself, in the upside scenario, half or more than half of movements from London City Airport, which is an important regional hub, um, would, would, would convert to hydrogen under favourable scenarios. And those scenarios would be, as I described, low cost um, for the supply of hydrogen itself. The top right hand chart there shows the point at which delivery by road would become difficult um, or, or, or impossible. So we see that from about 2040 uh, for large, very large airports, some kind of storage, quite likely liquefaction um, and parallel uh, hydrant-based delivery for very large airports will become necessary. So that's a very significant and long-term investment um, horizon. And the takeaways from this um, are, are, are also that um, from the work that Cranford University delivered on, on, on the airport um, component part of the study was that a, quite a high degree of automation would be required in the ground handling operations. Um, and this is partly um, due to operational resilience requirements, but also um, because the turnaround times um, could become, could for, for sure for more constrained airports, um, become significant sources of risk for operation, operational efficiencies. So that automation is a really important area for future R&D. And then just to conclude on, um, on, on where this is going next, the, the study focused on, um, on just the UK domestic market, up, up to only those 90 seat aircraft, currently working with um, Rolls-Royce and a number of other partners on a subsequent study um, called LH2GT, which is looking at um, the European uh, um, geography uh, and, and uh, aircraft up to about 200 seats. So extending the use of the airline behavior model to understand um, what conditions would enable successful hydrogen at that scale. Um, and of course, as a complement to SAF, which we'll hear about subsequently, particularly power to liquid SAFs, green hydrogen is a necessary ingredient anyway. So there's something of a no regrets core policy around production and distribution of green hydrogen to support both uh, ZEF and SAF. This issue of um, collaboration internationally is essential because particularly some of the new technology that will be required particularly around ground handling and some of the fuel systems um, needs to be consistent we can't have a, a mobile phone charger situation where um, uh, we need you know, different different solutions for for, for, for different geographies um, we've been really clear 
uh, with UK government that upstream supply of hydrogen is become, becoming a, a critical issue and understanding actually some of the renewable energy requirements that sit behind that, both for the production of hydrogen, but also for, um, for the airports, particularly where liquefaction is required, is very significant. So renewable electricity supply has become a, a really strong focus. Um, and uh, overall, the need for us to develop further R&D projects through this decade um, to really understand um, precisely uh, how the different actors in the sector need to prepare for, for hydrogen um, is clearly still very much, uh, very much there. So we, we welcome uh, an increasing number of studies that bring more, more data. And just finally to say that all of the uh, all of the um, research is available online um, uh, that sits behind this study. So it's not just the, the top line summary and report, but uh, you can delve down into some of the supporting um, evidence and information that some of the academic partners pulled together um, on, on the website. Um, a, a, a simple Google of, of napkin and Heathrow will pull that, uh, we'll pull that link up. Uh, Matt, thank you for uh, a really fascinating window into the future of, of hydrogen flight um, really bringing it to life for us there thank you very much um, and please stay stay online because we will be asking you questions a little bit later on but uh, thank you for joining uh, I'm delighted now to uh, introduce Erin Cook the sustainability director in fact the first sustainability director for San Francisco uh, International Airport um, she she works uh, as uh, the, the Sustainability Director, Zero Energy and Resilient Outcomes Committee Chair and Sustainable Aviation Fuel Working Group Co-Chair. Erin's um, work at uh, San Francisco has cut its greenhouse gas emissions by 41%, uh, operationalised its first zero net energy building and banned plastic foodware and water bottles at the airport. Erin uh, serves on the board of directors of the Institute of Sustainable uh, Infrastructure and is the co-chair of the ACI North America International Working Group, uh, SAF Task Group, and also on the ACI World Environmental Standing Committee, uh, formerly uh, City of Cupertino's first sustainability manager and deputy city ma manager, drafting and activating the city's first climate action plan. Erin was also a member of the climate planning teams at the con con Conservation Law Foundation, Goddard Institute of Space Studies, and National Park Service. Erin, you're a very, very busy person, so I'm delighted. <laughs> I'm delighted uh, to welcome you to the stage uh, to talk about uh, your work at San Francisco Airport. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thanks everyone for the opportunity to come and talk a little bit about uh, San Francisco International Airport or SFO's um, journey to really making true change as it relates to our climate. Um, we're an organization that's very and wholly focused on taking bold climate action and recognizing that it's an organization's responsibility not just to focus on its scope one and two emissions, but really where it has and how it can best leverage its sphere of influence to have true and total impact. Um, so I'll just walk through a couple of activities, um, knowing that probably most of you are very interested in more of our scope three puzzle. Um, but this for us is also really the journey towards when we say scope three, sustainable aviation fuel. Um, airports are in an interesting position in North America in that we're government agencies. We have a lot of FAA restrictions around how we spend our money, uh, but we feel that there are new and emerging markets and certainly a broad and robust suite of opportunities for us to more fully engage. So I'll talk through really what SFO's role um, and again, areas of impact have been for sustainable aviation fuel, and then where we're broadening our impact by really focusing more on building and driving um, coalition activities. Um, but just to set the stage on SFO, um, uh, San Francisco International Airport, uh, how many of you flew through SFO actually to get here? Awesome. Um, how many of you had the chance to fly through Terminal 1? I mean, I'm, there seems like we have a good international audience, but um, Terminal 1 or Harvey Milk Terminal, anyone? 
Yay. Okay, good. Awesome. <laughs> um, it's actually just this really wonderful kind of keystone project for us um, in focusing on the nexus between both sustainability as well as health and well-being of all of our passengers um, and our workforce. Uh, that's really the direction SFO is going and driving um, in that when we work on climate change and mitigating our greenhouse gas emissions, there are all these amazing co-benefits that relate to improved air quality, um, certainly, again, kind of well uh, health and fitness. Of, of the folks that we really look to safeguard as they journey, journey through our terminal. So, um, wow, I need to update this slide. Um, but uh, pre-COVID, we received about 58 million passengers, just to give you some context on the scale, um, certainly smaller than a Heathrow. Um, we're big fans of our Heathrow partners, um, and their impact and scale certainly is a good driver for us. Um, we actually have about 20 million square feet of facilities. Uh, we've done a great deal of work in constructing our and growing our um, uh, portfolio of buildings during actually COVID. Uh, many of those buildings, including Terminal 1, came online. Uh, and then, you know, generally, if we look at, again, sphere of influence, that scope three impact, um, who else do we represent and who else do we uh, really support in our organization? We have about over 40 airlines that come through and have to adhere to the airport's own contract or lease and use agreements. Um, and then about 140 concessionaires. So those food and beverage um, partners that we work with on the things like the water bottle ban. Um, generally, uh, we say we have about a 5,000 acre campus, but about half of it is already underwater, uh, and that is due to sea level rise, climate change, and also just having an interesting um, expanse into our uh, waters that surround our campus, the kind of seven miles that are dotted on that boundary of the bay. Um, and because of that climate impact, um, we're really focusing on not only just mitigation, but also resilience and adaptation. Um, very quickly, just a broad overview of our program. We've evolved like many organizations, I would say, in terms of the level of sophistication um, and maybe more of those key performance indicators, the drivers that we are focused on in achieving our sustainability objectives. We started very broad, adopting our industry standards, mostly around triple bottom line, social, environmental, um, and economic impact. And then we set a bolder ambition. We had this really wonderful working group that came together to set our airports we called BHAG. Uh, big, hairy, audacious goals. Some of you call them moonshots. There are lots of fun little titles out there, but we stuck with BHAGs. Um, and for us, that was really about the initial idea and concept of getting to zero. So um, our organization really indoctrinated that within our um, triple zero goals in a strategic plan that we set out in 2016. Those triple zero goals are targeted by 2030. Um, so zero net energy, zero carbon, and zero waste, um, as well as really, again, continuing on the nexus and the benefits of um, water balancing as well as health and wellness along the way. Uh, those I would like to recognize are about two decades prior to what our broader industry has set as their ambition. Um, we actually worked with ACI World and our Environmental Standing Committee to develop a playbook to net zero for our industry for airports um, worldwide and really coach that along the process to get ACI to adopt a net zero goal. But again, that's only 2050. Um, and what I always like to emphasize is, you know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has already told us that for many years already now, we have to get to peak emissions by 2025. So 2050 is 25 years too late. Even SFO's goals are five years too late. So we're really trying to figure out how we make exponential progress because now is the time to do that. Uh, one way that we feel we can do that is by at least setting the right KPI um, so that's what's shown on this bottom row. We've gone again, this is our most recent strategic plan into really figuring out within the three-year window or the five-year window of a strategic plan, what can we accomplish to make major headway into meet meeting our goals. Uh, and the way that we share that uh, headway is on an annual basis. The airport produces a zero annual report or a czar uh, that's really focused on elevating the accountability of our work and the transparency of our progress. Uh, to all of our airport partners, so those airlines, concessionaires, but all of uh, the broader industry. Um, this can be found online. Actually, we have an update that was just published this year and didn't make my slide deck uh, due to the timing. 
Um, and then just, again, really focusing on as we look at our net zero carbon pathway, that's really for us, all of the things we're, we're really working on, figuring out how to institutionalize more through a carbon lens. So our energy um, improvements as we go from fossil fuels um, to electricity actually are all a win for the airport. We have 100% renewable greenhouse gas emissions free um, energy. So our fund balance in scope two is zero. Um, but our zero carbon pathway pathway uh, is reasonably straightforward. We have to get all of the natural gas out of our buildings, all of the uh, fossil fuels out of our fleets. We're not on like really major, major cities and airports uh, globally, same portfolio. Um, but we also feel that it's incredibly critical that we focus beyond just what the airport is doing in scope one and two under our operational control unto what is within our scope three, our spheres of influence, as I said at the get-go. Um, um, and for that reason, it's really why we're focusing on scope three. Um, so if you look at kind of the tiny little sliver of scope one emissions, it's 0.5% of the total impact of the airport. Um, aircraft uh, full flight. So now our airport carbon accreditation takes into account full flight, not just landing and takeoff and taxiing as it once did. It's looking at all flights to total or final destination. Um, and so when we just actually reforecast based upon those new methodologies, um, it grew our, our scope three impact just from aircraft from 1 million metric tons of CO2 to 11 million metric tons of CO2. So that's about triple the total scope one impacts of say an Alaska airline. So quite significant. Um, so for that reason, it's why we've really been hyper-focused on um, sustainable aviation fuel and what we can do to support our airlines in making this transition. Um, so what's shown here is a graphic you probably see usually from an international perspective. We've looked to do really this forecasting for ourselves um, from a California perspective because we feel that California has tremendous leadership as it relates to climate change, really bold ambitions in terms of goal setting, but also an incredible powerhouse in our California Air Resources Board, um, which really has set the tone and the tenor for most of the other fossil fuel transitions throughout the country, whether it's it's um, setting clean vehicle standards for our light duty vehicles, now having an advanced clean trucking rule um, to really get electric vehicles at within the medium and heavy duty size on our roads, banning um, all of the fossil fuels that we're going to use in light duty vehicles. So, uh, sorry, banning basically anything that's uh, non-electric after 2035. Um, and they've actually been doing this within sustainable aviation fuel as well. So in 2019, the California Air Resources board uh, created the low carbon fuel standards opt-in inclusion of sustainable aviation fuel, um, which has really made California the market for sustainable aviation fuel investment. However, we're now actually getting outpaced by other states. There are new um, tax incentives that are coming online in Illinois. We're seeing actually, actually something similar um, coming in online also within Seattle. And we want to make sure that SAF itself can be a net driver for the emission reductions that we've set in our state. Uh, without that, we won't be able to meet our carbon reduction targets because as probably everyone in this room knows, um, realistically, as all of our other forms of emissions are able to fully decarbonize, i.e. move to all electric, so our buildings can go all electric, SFO went from one to we have now have 13 all electric buildings, our light duty, medium duty, and heavy duty vehicles that on-road transportation can also fully electrify, and we have pathways to do that. We do not not yet have that for aviation and for aircraft. Um, I'm sure we've heard about great people and I missed Matt's presentation. I know hydrogen aviation is coming, but that's, you know, 2035, 20, 20, 2040, 2050, more realistically, we need to get carbon out of our airplanes. And the best way to do that is for sustainable aviation fuel. So we're really working to align what our California state progress looks like to what our contribution can be to meeting the SAF Grand Challenge target and then also figuring out what California's role and percentage of that, that ambition can be. So we, we think generally if we're targeting 3 billion gallons, 1 billion gallons should be coming to California. 
Um, we've been doing that by really socializing and showing what an airport's role can be in sustainable aviation fuel. Um, so SFO actually launched a working group in 2018 um, to essentially adopt a, a, a goal for sustainable aviation fuel. We didn't know if it was possible, um, but we actually know now that it's probable and we'll be meeting our 5% target by next year. So 5% of our 1 billion gallons will be sustainable aviation fuel. Um, but we did that by working with all of our airlines um, our conventional fuel suppliers, pipeline operators, and then the sustainable aviation fuel producers that we know we're going to need to really build up and um, help grow the amount of fuel that's coming on campus. We drafted a sustainable aviation fuel feasibility study that looked at what was the supply chain barriers, the infrastructure barriers, and then also what would be the financial incentives that we really need in order to ensure that sustainable aviation fuel can lead, can grow, can commercialize, and can stay scale in California to serve our home market, but also certainly um, SFO. Um, and shown here are now some of our suppliers and partners. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of what our SAF study showed us. Um, actually, the we think the greatest benefit of doing this was really socializing and building out um, some logistics and really gap analyzing on behalf of our suppliers, again, and those pipeline operators, what we needed for on-site storage, for blending, and for really creating the transportation nexus to where the fuel would ultimately come into the pipeline and then come over to SFO from across the bay. As you can see, and I'm sorry, I don't think there's a pointer. Oh, yeah. Here. It's too far. Oh, here. Um, over at, oh, as you can see, basically, this is not going to work. I'm just going to point to everyone around the room. Um, the majority of our supply infrastructure is really coming from the East Bay. Um, so right now, the, all of our fuel at SFO is being barged in, delivered to Selby, and then basically piped into our manifold um, that's across the bay run by Kinder Morgan. Uh, this is a model and certainly what our DOE colleagues and other airports, major airports that already have pipeline pathways to deliver the fuel are working to really grow sustainable aviation fuel volumes. We don't want the fueling infrastructure on our site. It doesn't make sense for us to blend it. Um, we usually are incredibly real estate constrained. And so really leveraging those assets that are already in place um, and helping them also transition to a lower particulate, a lower NOx, and certainly a lower GHG fuel has a great benefit for everyone in the communities that are adjacent to it. Um, and as I talk about those air quality benefits, um, something we are really working to try to amplify and scale is recognition of, you know, what we're generally calling the non-CO2 benefits. Um, things that people often don't think about relative to SAF, there's so much focus on the greenhouse gas emissions potential, which is great, but because sustainable aviation fuel has the ability to reduce SOx and particulate matter by about 80%, um, we think it's an important source reduction opportunity for the airport. We're already doing a lot of filtering, and this is actually showing what our air filtration process looks like within our buildings. We're filtering for naphthalene, for benzene, for PM, um, and that requires a great deal more energy to basically process that air through our HVAC system, but also a higher level of filtration in order to accommodate and uh, capture those particulates. We think we're going to start seeing the benefits of, of uplifting that SAF at the combustion point by making dramatic improvements within that air quality and potentially saving us from a facilities perspective. Um, we're also really working to socialize these benefits to our customers. It's amazing to me how few people actually know what sustainable aviation fuel really is. Um, and then we're also working to really monitor and do some forecasting on what our progress should look like. So uh, mapping in where the production facilities exist, uh, how they can provide SAF to the airport and SFO, and just basically getting ready for it, all the while ensuring we're maintaining our competitive to others, uh, mostly across the state through better policy levers um, and incentives. Um, I'm about out time, so um, I can just very quick, kind of maybe two, 30 more seconds. Um, I will just say SFO is also all in and making sure that I promised also I would stay at time and I was like, I can totally do it. Um, so SFO is working to really share our story and our journey with airports globally. Um, I ran a SAF task group and we've put together a playbook for how airports can engage in sustainable aviation fuel development on our campus. Um, that's available through the ACI website, Airport Council International. Um, and now we're also lastly, and most importantly, really trying to 
basically harness those air quality benefits by contemplating and, and lobbying and ideally advocating for change so that there can be new markets where airports are able to buy the non-CO2 benefits on behalf of our community. So those air quality, the SOX and the PM benefits that we're already obligated to buy through Title V, we all have air permits that essentially say that every stationary source of combustion, our gen sets, we have to buy air quality offsets for or improvements. Why are we doing that out of sector? Why can't we do that within the aviation sector and buy sustainable aviation fuel investments? Um, that's something we lobby for through a new policy, um, AB 1322, if anyone's heard of it. It went through all the way through the California legislature, adopted unanimously, and then it was vetoed by our governor. So we are working with the governor now to figure out what the pathway to create new incentive mechanisms really look like. Um, and we think we have great scientific research, actually, that's being led here out of UC Davis um, to look at what the air quality improvements are, model them relative to renewable diesel so that ho hopefully we can create incentives so that finally SAF can outcompete um, RD um, in the incentive market, which it can't today. So that's our journey. And uh, certainly we are midstream, early stream. I'm not really sure what part of the stream, but uh, we're working, we're trying to make progress and we are really excited for new partners um, to come online. So if this interests you, you're interested in joining the coalition or supporting sustainable aviation fuel growth in our state and throughout um, certainly the world, um, let's talk after this. Thanks. So thank you, Erin, for a really inspiring presentation on the great work that's being done on SFO on sustainability challenges. And really great to hear how airports can be a part of integrating SAF into the aviation system. Uh, so please keep the Slido questions coming. We're getting lots of good ones that we'll tackle at the end of the presentations. Uh, now we're moving on to our next presenter. So Erin spoke at the end of her presentation about uh, non-CO2 as in local air quality. Our next presentation is going to look at non-CO2 from a different perspective, that of contrails. So our presenter is Jerry Griffin. He's the general manager at Delta Airlines and a member of Delta's global sustainability team. And he oversees the development and execution of the company's sustainability strategy. He launched the cross-divisional team, managing fuel savings across the airline's operations and established the company's contrail research collaboration with MIT. So oh, MIT <laughs> would be a better way of saying it, wouldn't it? So thank you very much, Jerry, and over to you. So thank you for, for having, having me and uh, having Delta present here. Uh, apologies, I can't be in there in person today, but uh, really, really wish I was. I would uh, always love coming to California. Um, so the, the other thing I want to say before I kick this off is, um, you know, just give some thanks to MIT's Lab for Aviation and the Environment. So uh, Stephen Barrett, Stephen Barrett, Florian Alrogan, Sebastian Easton, uh, Vincent Meyer, and there's several others. But uh, you know, I say that at first because the, the research that's been done in this space has been critical for us understanding this. And you know, I think it's um, you know, it says something that this uh, this um, conference is being hosted at UC Davis, right? Who provides a lot of research. So um, wanted to start with that. Thank you, and and we'll get into the presentation here. So. Um, let me pull up my presentation here. Get this into full screen mode for us. So, want to talk about contrails. Um, so there is a long research history around contrails, but um, there's a lot of growing attention on it because um, of various uh, various reasons around, uh, you know, greater recognition as an impact on climate. So. What I want to talk to you all about today is, is really just to answer a number of questions, and we'll try to do this all in 15 minutes or less. Um, and, uh, you know, you could have, we could have an hour long, two hour long, three hour long discussion uh, on all these topics, but I just really want to get the basics out there. So what we'll learn today, what are contrails? Then why do we care about them? And how do we measure their environmental impact? And we'll talk about the solutions that exist for managing that impact. And then I want to share a little bit about what Delta is doing. You know, I also want to point out there are several other groups across the aviation industry working on this. 
um, Philippe, as an example, uh, we had a great conversation about a week ago um, where, where we traded feedback on, on this presentation itself because he and Airbus have done work in this space. So um, really collaborative environment behind the scenes, even if we might not be releasing everything publicly every day, um, but the contrail space is growing rapidly. So just get into it. What are contrails? So contrails are short, is short for a condensation trail. So you all have seen these. Um, most of you are probably aviation uh, geeks and love aviation and, and you love seeing those clouds because they tell you an airplane's overhead. But they are the line shaped clouds produced by uh, in, in the wake of uh, aircraft engine exhaust. Um, and, the, and they're caused by that, uh, the interaction between uh, the atmospheric conditions of the day and that that engine exhaust, um, and so this graphic gives you a little bit of an overview of, of you know how this how this happens. Um, it's a you know it's a phenomenon that does not always happen during flight, um, and so you know what you're seeing here in this graphic does not always occur, but when it does occur, you see those contrails. So, why do we care about them? And we'll get into the three different types of contrails to go over this. So there are three different types of contrails, and they have been researched for different reasons. So early interest in this area was from militaries. So uh, when we started flying a lot of aircraft for military purposes, uh, we realized that you could see you had a line that pointed exactly to where your aircraft was. And so the research in this space is, uh, goes back a very long time into how these things form. Um, and there's really, you know, that that research was in those three different areas, short-lived, persistent non-spreading, persistent contrails. Uh, today's research is really focused on environmental impact. So, you know, well understood relatively how contrails form, and that was that early research. Now we're looking at environmental impact. So we talk about these types of contrails. Uh, the definitions speak to themselves, but let's just make it clear, short-lived. These are uh, the contrails that form and then rapidly dissipate, and you don't see them within a matter of, let's call it, you know, seconds to minutes uh, behind the aircraft. Then there are persistent non-spreading contrails. So it's a line-shaped cloud, but it stays very thin, and that thinness and thickness matters, as we'll talk about in a little bit. But this last one is persistent spreading contrails. So these are the ones we most care about for environmental impact because these contrails actually start to mimic a, a cirrus cloud, and it often we'll call them, um, you know, an artificial cloud deck or artificial cirrus cloud or man-made cirrus cloud. And uh, in many cases, if you looked up in the sky without having uh, looked at as many pictures of contrails as I have, you might not even notice that you're looking at a contrail. You'll just think to yourself, wow, there's a lot of kind of somewhat line-shaped cirrus clouds in the sky. But... Um, the you know the the research in the space indicates that those persistent spreading contrails could be a large portion of aviation's contribution to climate warming. So why do we care about them, right? These contrails have a radiative radiative forcing effect um, that can be warming or cooling based on ambient conditions of the day, right? So you know, quick tutorial in climate science and climate warming and cooling. You know, really the mechanism that we're talking about is whether it's CO2, whether it's contrails or other um, other emissions, right? Is that is that thing we're looking at, in this case contrails, is it reflecting heat? Is it reflecting the sun's um, radiation or is it holding in the earth's heat? And so depending on the time of the day, the conditions that exist, you get complex interactions. The simplest way to put it is on this left-hand side of the chart. In the daytime, if you form a contrail, you have a good chance, uh, it kind of depends what's happening, but you have a good chance of reflecting more solar radiation than you let in, which would cause a bit of a cooling effect. Um, at night, when the sun is um, you know, on the other side of the earth, the only thing that contrail is going to do is create a nice little warm blanket for the earth and reflect that thermal radiation back down to the Earth's surface. We'll get into the modeling around all this, but uh, research today says, you know, the net effect, when you look at all the times that contrails form, you try to model that out, is that you get a net warming impact from contrails, but there's a lot of uncertainty 
which we'll talk about in a moment. So how do we measure their impact? Um, and this, this, this is going to start to point at some of the numbers we'll get to later. But a lot of this has to be modeled, right? We don't, uh, you know, we don't have um, cameras and sensors all over, uh, you know, cameras all over the earth and sensors throughout the sky to say, uh, to detect and observe every single contrail that's forming. So what we have to do is take the observations we can, of which there are a lot, and make some assumptions based on the weather data we get, the observations of contrails, and make some assumptions about those interactions. And that's what's modeled out. And we basically take those observations and say, if these contrails are forming according to these models, this is the net impact that we think there will be on the environment. And that's often called this radiative forcing effect. So um, going into measurement, and now we'll get a little bit more to the point of how large this impact. Um, like I said, in practice, this measurement relies on modeling and is uh, dependent on a lot of parameters that are up for debate or in you know being actively researched. Um, as a result, estimates of contrails warming impact very widely based on some of the assumptions there. But when you start to look at all the research, and, and this was pulled from a, a paper Lee et al. Uh, apologies, I didn't have the source written down here. But um, you know, we could get into detail about you know which studies to use and how these have an impact. But long story short, you see this uh, this chart here tries to compare contrails, carbon dioxide, and then have a net aviation impact here, and it's saying. You know, where is the impact on warming uh, coming from aviation? And what you see here is that contrails could be very large, but there's a large uncertainty band around that. CO2 is very large, but we understand that pretty well. We have a very good, uh, we have a good estimate of how, how much warming impact CO2 has. But, you know, folks talk about this uncertainty. The, the item I want to point out here is even if contrails is at the lowest end of this uncertainty band, that's still quite positive um, in, in uh, quite large in terms of aviation's total impact. So what does that push the industry to do? It's to work and focus on understanding this better, getting better measurements, thinking about how contrails could be avoided. And that's where a lot of the rest of this um, presentation will get into. But you know, why does all that uncertainty exist? Um, it has to do with these models. Uh, do we, you know, how accurate or how, how well do our models uh, tell us where and when contrails are forming? When those contrails form, uh, what do our models say about the composition of those contrails, the, the shape of the ice crystals, the size of the contrails, um, and how does that impact your final estimate? And so that's where a lot of this uncertainty comes into place. Um, so what solutions exist for this? So I, I show this little bit of a complicated slide here, um, which shows sort of temperature conditions in the atmosphere and then relative humidity conditions in the atmosphere on the y-axis, uh, temperature on the x-axis. So persistent contrails, the ones we care about, form in sufficiently humid and sufficiently cold conditions. And the reason for this chart is to say, this is a relatively small, small area, right? And so they, they only form around 14% of the time in cruise. Um, so the goal would be, you know, could we avoid those areas, right? Or could we do something with the aircraft to avoid contrails? And so this is a quick overview of the solutions that exist in this space, you know, thoughts that, Switching fuels could help, so fuels with lower soot emissions or um, uh, different exhaust characteristics uh, might uh, might uh, help with contrail formation. Active area of research, I think, uh, would not make any bold claims about um, any specific fuels at this point. Uh, engine modifications could help uh, because you're changing the exhaust output. Um, again, active area of research. Convoying, so what Philippe talked about a little earlier, um, that could reduce the impact of contrails because your planes are now flying in a line. And so you don't have two different contrails. You really just have one if they're going to form a contrail. And the fourth one, which is where uh, 
Delta has been doing research with MIT is deviation. This is one that's become very popular um, in, in some news articles and such lately because of uh, the fact that you know with the previous three solutions, those may only help reduce contrails. Deviation could help you avoid a large portion of all contrails um, out there today, uh, the contrails that are forming. So let's talk about deviation a little bit more. We talked about where contrails form, where persistent contrails form as being uh, these ice supersaturated regions where it's sufficiently cold and sufficiently humid. Um, those regions tend to be horizontally very wide. Talk about 100 miles wide, um, that type of width. But vertically, very thin, you know, on the order of 1,000 to 4,000 feet in uh, depth. And so uh, if you put together some basic models around where contrails form, you quickly come to a theory that says um, you could avoid a lot of these contrail forming regions with a minimum with a minimal amount of fuel burn, uh, you know, less than 5% system-wide fuel burn increase to avoid all contrails, which could be a large portion of aviation's impact on climate change. So the next question that comes up logically is, well, how easy is this to do? Because we were already talked about these models being somewhat uncertain in predicting these things. So how well can we predict the regions we want to avoid? Um, the quick answer is we're not that good at predicting these regions today. Um, uh, a comparison I'll steal from a, a, someone I talked uh, to, a very smart person I've talked to in this in this space is, you know, uh, this is like turbulence uh, when, when we first really started caring about turbulence many, many years ago. Um, we didn't have all the models available then that would allow us to predict where turbulence regions were forming. But we think that can get better. So that's the positive message. But today, forecast-based models are not accurate enough um, for wide-scale adoption at this point. Or I, I would say that that's the reason you haven't seen wide-scale adoption of something like control avoidance yet is because you get a lot of false positives and false negatives when you go to try and move any flight based on a region. That is, if I take this model and ask it, am I going to fly through a region? Many of the times it says I will, I may or may not be flying through an actual control forming region. And a small portion of the time, I'll get these true positives. Um, I guess everybody now knows false positives, false negatives very well because of COVID. So uh, won't need to describe that chart too much. Um, so what's the research focus for us then? So seeing all this data that I've talked about, that I've tried to sum up in you know the last uh, eight, eight, 10 minutes here, um, we're really working with MIT to try and address the fundamental obstacles to avoidance. And in our minds, some of the biggest obstacles right now are accuracy of predictive models for those regions, and then actual observations. So the ability to, after a flight, analyze whether you did avoid a contrail or not, and not just rely on a model. So try to get better observations. Um, really excited about what they're doing. They, there's a lot of published research on their end. If you, if you look it up on their website, the MIT's Lab for Aviation and the Environment, but uh, the distinctive thing they've done with relatively new uh, available data is that um, you know they use uh, geostationary satellite data from NASA that was uh, started being published back in uh, the 2016-2017 timeframe uh, when that satellite was put into service, and they analyze that to identify contrails, and they can identify those in real time or near real time every five minutes or so. And so what you get is an ability to observe where contrails are forming. So this chart shows the percent coverage of contrails over the United States um, for the 2018 to 2019 year. And what you see in you know, a lot of their papers will show that it, this is just taking in observations and observing where contrails form. Very good um, insight into the fact that you can use geostationary satellites to, I, to identify contrails, which is completely new to be able to see contrails at this kind of scope and scale in real time. And so we're trying to leverage this data to uh, build into real-time avoidance techniques, which will allow you to make some um, 
progress on saying, if I tried to avoid a contrail, did I actually avoid it or not? And can we validate that with visual observation of contrails forming or not forming based on something I did with the flight? And so that's where we're headed with the research is to uh, do trials of contrail avoidance using this type of technology and then be able to validate that. Not just say, hey, I, I'm pretty sure I avoided a contrail based on this model I used, but to say, I tried, I tried to avoid a contrail based on a model, and then I looked and saw that I did or did not, and you could say something about the accuracy. And we think that'll push the ball forward on, on the ability to accurately predict these regions. So really excited about that work. Um, would love to talk to him more and answer questions later, but um, you know, wrap up here and saying, you know, this is what we covered. Uh, you know, folks in this group should feel free to reach out to me. It's a complex topic and would love to talk more about it, but um, hopefully, hopefully you got a lot out of this discussion and uh, I'll pass it on to our, our next presenter to move on from here. Jerry, thank you so much for um, breaking breaking down a, a complex subject into uh, some really uh, really clear explanations of what the way forward is. Uh, and I'm, there are questions coming in on Slido for you for a little bit later on. So I look forward to uh, hearing your answers to some of those. Uh, now moving on, uh, delighted to invite Andrea Dietz to the to the stage. Uh, Andrea is the Asia Pacific Manager for uh, for the FAA. Uh, she's a foreign affairs specialist with the FAA, Office of International Affairs, uh, having been in the FAA for 12 years. Um, it's, it all sounds very glamorous. <laughs> the desk officer for Southeast Asia and the Caribbean. I quite like that job. Um, prior to this, Andrea was uh, an environmental protection specialist in the FAA. A Office of Environment and Energy, where she was the agency lead on uh, climate change adaptation, and that's what she's talking about today. She was also engaged in uh, community engagement, uh, NEPA, and aircraft noise issues. Um, Andrea co-leads the climate adaptation work within the uh, ICAO CAPE Working Group 2, which published has published numerous uh, climate adaptation synth synthesis reports and guidance material on aviation climate change, vulnerability, risk assessment, and adaptation measures. Thank you, uh, Andrea, for coming up to talk to us about climate adaptation. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I'm delighted to be here in California with you all. This is my first experience at the symposium and it has been uh, a true joy to, to hear from everybody, to learn from everybody uh, and, and to just be here. So thank you so much for that, that warm introduction. So as Ian mentioned, I am going to be talking about climate change adaptation, strengthening resilience to climate change impacts on aviation. Uh, we have had a lot of great presentations this morning and uh, reducing carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases. And of course that is incredibly important, um, but also as uh, I believe Aaron noted, there are uh, impacts already facing the aviation sector today. So considering how we are adapting and making sure that aviation as a whole is linked to the changes that are very important. Oh, there we go. Okay, so the outline for this presentation today, I am going to talk through very quickly some of the, the projections that we're considering in both the international and then the domestic sphere, uh, vulnerabilities to aviation and, and some examples of those, adaptation measures, and then what uh, some of the things that the Department of Transportation and the FAA are doing uh, on climate adaptation right now, and then of course some resources uh, as backup material. So projections on, on climate adaptation, I think everybody is very familiar with sea level rise. One of the other things that we are looking at in aviation is average and extreme temperatures, um, also increased intensity and frequency of storms, changes in precipitation, change in, changes in icing, Desertification, which is the, the general sort of drying of, of an environment, um, and then changes in biodiversity. So the reason that these are important for, for aviation um, is that all of them individually can have 
impacts on the various different components of the sector, from the airlines that are operating around the world uh, to the airports that are in a fixed location and uh, subject to just whatever the, the environment may bring to them, um, and to the air navigation service providers that are, are trying to manage the traffic, as well as, of course, the manufacturers and everybody else that may be involved in aviation. Uh, so when we look at something like changes in biodiversity, you might say, well, why would that have an impact on aviation uh, for an airport that's just sitting, you know, and can't move? Uh, if you start to see a, a change in the migratory bird patterns that are coming in, that could have a huge impact, even something as changes in the, the different types of plant life that are growing in an area can attract different types of wildlife, which can have huge impacts. Um, and and then something like the, the increased average and extreme temperatures uh, for the operators, you can have challenges with uh, load lift capability and, and require either longer runways uh, for takeoff or reduced weight um, or changing your operations to uh, operate when, when the temperatures aren't as high, whether that is a seasonal change or a change uh, on the day to operate rather than, you know, at noon, uh, operate earlier or, or later in the day when the sun isn't, isn't bright. Um, the chart that you see here is from the ICAO climate risk assessment document. This is not a unique uh, chart to ICAO. I'm sure that many of you have seen something like this in various publications. Um, it's just looking at the likelihood that something might happen and then taking a look at the consequence of whether that event actually uh, takes place, what, what would that consequence be? And then um, those two items together is your risk. So if something is a really low likelihood uh, to, to happen, um, but has a significant consequence, if it does, your, your risk ends up somewhat higher. Um, and, and the converse is true as well. Uh, which leads us to the examples of vulnerabilities. Um, as we are, are talking about the, the different climate change impacts, um, we, of course, you know, the, the first thing that comes up are, are the delays and cancellations. As I mentioned, um, there are changes to the frequency storms. Um, while we can't attribute any one storm at this point to climate change specifically, we do know that storms generally are becoming more strong. Um, and more frequent. And when that happens, there may be greater delays and cancellations. Um, there may be needs to reroute aircraft um, based on where storms are located. Uh, there can also be damage to infrastructure, and this can come from storms, it can come from sea level rise, it can come from temperatures, um, all ki kinds of damage is, is possible. Um, temporary or permanent water inundation is a significant thing that, I, that in the United States we're looking at, but also is a global problem. Um, as I mentioned already, with the, the load lift reduction um, capabilities, with the increased temperatures on extreme high heat days, um, also drainage capacity, that would be more for something uh, at an airport or for um, other, you know, like air navigation service providers that have infrastructure that is fixed and, and needs to <laughs> stay dry. Um, and then, as I mentioned, changes in, in wildlife patterns um, can, can also be a vulnerability for aviation. And the, the graphic you're seeing here is the snowfall analysis from this past year. Um, I think everybody that was here in the United States is very well aware that we had record snowfall. Um, and actually, it doesn't show the California region, but I know that here in California, there was a tremendous amount of snowfall as well. Um, so this was not uh, it, uh, exclusive to those dates that are limited there and, and that region. Um, and I should have put a California picture there. So apologies for that. So adaptation measures. When we're talking about climate change adaptation, it's important to remember that there's no one size fits all. So whether you are an air navigation service provider, a regulator, um, if you're an airport or an airline or a manufacturer, 
there's there's not going to just be a playbook that you can take off the shelf and say, okay, great, here's my adaptation plan. This is all the things we have to do. Check the box. We're good. Um, it needs to be tailored to your specific situation and the vulnerabilities that you are facing based on that risk. So looking at uh, how likelihood, the likelihood and then the consequence and, and then creating something that actually addresses what you may be facing term. Uh, it can include both infrastructure and operational changes, and this is going to depend a lot on, on who is actually doing the work and, and what the, the impacts may be to the organization. Um, adaptation measures can vary in cost and complexity. I think that, especially when we're talking in the international arena, there's a lot of misconception that you need to have, you know, a billion dollar budget um, and a team of researchers that are available to to uh, do any work, and um, that's great if you have that. Um, and and certainly, the the larger the budget, the more people you have working on this issue, the the more complex you can get. Um, but there are things that uh, even a, a small uh, organization or airport can take on um, that that go a long way to helping. And again, it's it's all about taking a look at where risks are and uh, addressing vulnerabilities. That's sort of that targeted area, so that especially if you're dealing with a situation with limited resources, limited people, um, that you are are spending those resources wisely. Um, and then again, the other thing about climate adaptation is that it has to be periodically reviewed, um, just like there's no book that you can pull off the shelf and check all those boxes. Uh, you also can't just come up with a plan and say, okay, great, this is what it is, walk away from it and never look back. Because as we all know, the climate is changing, the, the projections are changing all the time, based on the different emission scenarios that, that we're projecting into the future, things will look very different uh, in the next 20, 30, 50 years from what they, they look like now. And we can estimate what that may be. And as we're, we're planning for it, we, we can be planning for whatever the best scenario is that fits the, the risk and vulnerabilities that your organization is facing. But you also have to go back and reevaluate and see, okay, well, how did this line up? Are, are we more or less in line with what we were expecting? Do we need to uh, change something? Is, is this actually working? Is it not working? And then make those changes so that it stays fresh. Um, so that is the adaptation measure slides. Um, I do want to talk about some of the things that DOT and FAA are doing. Um, as you heard from my bio, I'm not in the Office of Environment and Energy. I'm in our, our Office of International Affairs. So I'm dealing with this at much more of an international level, working with our international partners, um, predominantly through ICAO, but also um, in, in some situations more bilaterally. Um, at the, the DOT FAA domestic level, though, there is a lot of work going on. I think it, it's no surprise to this, this group that this is a priority uh, area for the current administration. So there's a lot of work that's being um, done at all levels within the department and within the agency. So one of the things that FAA is doing, uh, led through our Office of Environment and Energy, is determining uh, the critical infrastructure that FAA has. We have over 10,000 assets that are across the United States, uh, US territories, and also in some international locations, which means that we have a, a huge range of both uh, assets that we would determine critical and also assets that are in a, a variety of locations from uh, small islands to the Alaskan mountains. And so the different impacts that, uh, that FAA infrastructure is facing has this huge range. Um, and so as part of the work that our Office of Environment and Energy is doing, they are looking at all of these assets, determining what is most critical, and then coming up with uh, the list of those vulnerabilities where those risks may be so that they can prioritize action as, as needed moving forward. 
Other things that FAA is doing is a lot of research in this area, and this is spread across um, not only our Office of Environment and Energy, but also our Office of Airports and uh, NextGen. Um, so these are just some examples of, of the research. There's a lot of research that FAA does that could have gone on the slide or could tie into climate adaptation in some way, but the airport resilience analysis framework is one thing that uh, our Office of Airports is, is working on, and that is going to help prioritize uh, where vulnerabilities may be and how things can move forward. Um, again, I am not the expert on that project, but I'm happy to connect anybody with the folks who are. Um, in our office of NextGen, they're doing research on terminal area icing weather information. Um, and that graphic there, which I unfortunately cannot explain to you, um, is from a, a report that they recently put out. Um, and then uh, the other things that FAA is looking at is, is our future planning. So as we are identifying vulnerabilities, as we are identifying the risks and beginning to prioritize the things that matter uh, to, the, to the agency most, um, we are looking at the incorporation of different materials, designs, processes to strength and resilience. And again, this is for FAA infrastructure. Um, it's it's very specific to those 10,000 assets that I mentioned. Um, contractual language changes to make sure that uh, things continue to move forward in, in the more resilient way. And then, um, as I mentioned, development of new processes uh, specifically to address climate adaptation. And that work there under the future plans is, is being led also through our Office of Environment and Energy. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, I wanted to also just share some resources with you um, that are specific to this topic. Um, at the USG level, you may be familiar with the National Climate Assessment. The fourth National Climate Assessment is the one that's currently out right now. It was developed a few years ago. The fifth National Climate Assessment is in development. Um, this is something that the FAA is involved in. I reviewed it. Um, some of our folks in Office of Environment and Energy reviewed it. Um, and it's, it's going to be published, I think, sometime later this year, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, the United States Aviation Climate Action Plan is something that Don mentioned yesterday. That is through, uh, it's, it's a U.S. plan, um, which is why it fits under this USG category here. Um, FAA was obviously very heavily involved in that, uh, along with our other USG partners. And then, um, as I mentioned, DOT is our parent organization at the FAA, and they also have a climate action plan for resilience. Um, both the U.S. Uh, Aviation Climate Action Plan and the DOT plan came out in 2021. Um, in the in the bio, uh, I, you heard that I co-lead some work actually with Rachel through ICAO CAPE, um, and there are some resources there for you as well. Uh, the first is the 2018 Climate Adaptation Synthesis, which uh, is the first synthesis that uh, ICAO produced on this topic. Uh, we are currently in the process of updating the synthesis, uh, which will be out in a few years. Um, and then the 2022 Climate Risk Assessment Adaptation and Resilience Guidance is also uh, an ICAO document. And both of those uh, documents, although really the second one is three documents, are published uh, on the ICAO website. They're available free of charge to anybody who wants to download them and take a look. And then uh, we've already mentioned the IPC the sixth, the sixth assessment report is currently available, um, and that was released over a span of years with the synthesis report being the most recent uh, release of that document. So I know I am over time. Um, thank you so much, uh, everybody. And if anybody has any questions, comments, um, feel free to reach out to me. And like I said, I'm happy to connect you with the folks um, that are the, the experts on things in these slides that I'm not an expert on uh, back home. So thank you. So try again. Thank you, Andrea, for that great overview of the impacts of climate change for the aviation sector and airports and what we can do about it. Um, we thank you to all of our presenters for a great session. We apologize because we realize we are a little bit over time, but as we've had such good questions coming in on Slido, we did just want to take a little bit of extra time to at least ask one question each to all of our presenters. So the first question, do you want? Yeah. So here we go. First question.
Uh, the first question is for you, Philippe, actually. Um, how do aircraft transition from this en route formation uh, to the terminal environment uh, in the fellow fly scenario? Yeah, good question. So um, we, uh, we anticipate that um, uh, through a process with ATC and what we may it procedure. So it's a recovery of um, uh, the responsibility of the two aircraft getting back to ATC. Then uh, by just reaching a different flight level, they, they can be just managed as two separate aircraft. And then after that, after that split point, uh, uh, do their final way to their airport uh, as usual. Thank you, Philippe. Very clear and helpful. So the next question is for Matt, if you're still, yes, I see you there. Great. So the question is, has there been a study on the total cost to create the hydrogen infrastructure and potential timelines or feasibility to construct that infrastructure? Thank you. It's, it's a really good question. And I, I think the answer, um, so far as I'm aware, is no, not there's not a comprehensive um, understanding of the total infrastructure requirement. And that's one of the really important gaps. Um, and it is slightly chicken and egg because it's important for us to model the um, extent to which hydrogen will play a role in the market in order to size the infrastructure in the right way. What we do have is a number of nations have produced essentially industrial strategies for hydrogen. So you can look at, um, for instance, the, the French, German, UK markets as, as good examples of all produced national plans for hydrogen infrastructure. But there's still a lack of understanding about the total power requirement required upstream. Um, the requirement at airports is needs to be right sized to the market. Um, and actually, one of the other issues is that, um, as I mentioned, the international um, uh, interoperability of the technology also needs to uh, needs to be established. So there are lots of studies out there. No one has stitched together that I'm aware of that kind of total view of cost. And this is going to be really important in um, determining the merits of uh, power to liquid SAFs and direct burn uh, liquid hydrogen for different contexts. Thank you, Matt. Uh, clearly more research needed there. Um, Erin, great question for you. Um, about half your reduction in emissions forecasted for 2050 is expected from carbon capture and sequestration and carbon offsets. Can you say more about them? Thank you, whoever spent a good amount of time digging into our greenhouse gas emission in inventory. Um, by 2030, we're actually projecting that about 92% of our emissions will be um, removed, not removed, but offset, I guess removed, yeah, because we'll be using all electric, an all electric central plant, all electric buildings, and then all electric um, fleet vehicles, our air train and many fleet vehicles are already electrified. The really the carbon fund balance for us comes from operationalizing that, um, central plant new central plant that's in you know undergoing environmental review right now so um what we are planning on doing is <laughs> Uh, very simply, yes, absolutely looking at carbon removals, um, some up, upstream, some on site. Um, but also I laugh because um, I think generally there needs to be a wild transformation in the way that we do greenhouse gas emissions accounting to not just include the sources of emissions, but also embodied carbon. And I'm hoping that we can start to take better advantage of embodied carbon. Um, our airport, for example, already really focuses on the embodied carbon in the main materials that we using construction, so concrete and steel. We use carbon sequestered concrete already within our um, uh, major surfaces, not including runways, but sidewalks and roadway repairs and things. And we don't get any carbon benefit from that in terms of our balance sheet because of the greenhouse gas emissions protocol. So I also think that there will be this kind of transition to us recognizing embodied carbon and that being part of that scope one offset. 
Thank you. Again, a very clear answer and very ambitious and forward thinking. Great to hear. OK, so a question for Jerry. It's on contrail avoidance. Are there any low hanging fruit with aircraft requesting alternate altitudes based on observations from previous aircraft? Um, difficult to answer um, because I think the person might be referring to, say, the way we do turbulence, right? Like uh, crowdsourcing responses from pilots who are observing contrails in real time. Um, short answer is maybe. Um, I think the, sh the lowest hanging fruit is actually from some of the geostationary satellite imagery work that's being done. Um, some might argue that it's low hanging fruit to just use these forecast models and accept a pretty low level of accuracy. Um, but uh, in terms of something where we'd be able to do an activity and feel highly confident that we avoided a contrail on a single deviation of a flight, we're not there yet in terms of low-hanging fruit. But you know, I, I could see the technology developing very well over the next five to ten years um, if if um, if if what I'm what we're seeing so far in the research is promising. Five, five years really or less. So i um, excited for what we're doing. I wish I could share more. I would love to show you some of the tools, but I don't want any of our uh, PhD students uh, or postdocs we're working with having their research poached. So um, hoping that'll be, uh, we'll be able to share more in the coming months and years. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, we don't want uh, research being poached, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, in due course, maybe you come back and uh, and and tell us uh, a bit more as the uh, as the the story emerges. I think it is a fascinating area. Yeah, and um, just another point there: our research agreement is about is open source. So the technology and tools that we'll develop will be open sourced. So the goal is to get it out there as soon as possible. So I'd be excited to to share that when the time is right. That's great, showing real leadership in the uh, in the non CO two area. Well done, um, Andrea. And clearly, the FAA has a a huge amount of uh, expertise and intellectual property in the area of uh, of climate adaptation. Is there anything you can do to support airports who want to uh, implement climate adaptation measures? Yeah, absolutely. So again, I'm not the, the airport expert here. I'm happy to connect folks to the to the people that back home that are. Um, but there are a, a variety of things. Um, the FAA does have grants, the, the AIP grants, the Airport Improvement Program, um, and those are available. And um, some of the funding, some projects may qualify under that. Um, also, it's a, a little bit more sidestep, I suppose, but through the, and I should have mentioned it on the list of resources, but um, through the Transportation Research Board um, Airport Cooperative Research Program, um, there is a lot of work that's already been published that FAA has been involved in as a liaison to that, that work, um, and that has specific uh, information in there uh, on climate change, adaptation, resilience, there's different toolkits, um, that kind of thing. So that that's also out there and available. Um, but I think that the the best answer I can give for you today is that if there is a specific question um, from somebody here in the room uh, or from, I guess, online, if you want to just uh, ask me or, or exchange information, I'm happy to connect you with our folks in the Office of Airports who can, who can give you a more robust uh, answer to that question. Thank you, Andrea. This is certainly an area where we're going to have to put more and more focus in the years ahead. So great to hear about the resources that are available. So we're going to bring it to an end there. Um, we'd like to thank the audience and the organisers for their indulgence of having letting us have that little bit of extra time. Appreciate it. There are lots more questions there, but our presenters will be around for a little while if you want to engage with them personally. And on behalf of myself and Ian, a, a huge thank Thank you to all of our presenters today for their really interesting and informative presentations. Okay.